Hello, and welcome to lecture one of ichthyology. Essentially what this is, is this is an online, free, publicly accessible class on ichthyology. It will be at the level, detail, and knowledge-wise of a full-on college course, um, but there's no keeping up, there's no homework. These lectures are just publicly available for you to watch. My name is Zachary. I am a fish biologist. I work primarily with diseases and parasites in aquaculture systems, mainly focused on saprinidae, uh, which is something that we will look at when we learn the taxonomy of fishes. Uh, and I'm gonna be teaching this ichthyology class because I am a firm believer that knowledge of fish is extremely underrated in current society and underrepresented. I think that we need more people who know what they're talking about when it comes to fish because Fish are a huge part of diets, no matter where you go in the world, and they're a huge part of the ecosystems that we're trying to protect. So even just the most general knowledge can be absolutely essential uh, in our world. So this first lecture, we're going to talk about what is a fish. Uh, this is an important place to start because it's not as simple as it might seem. When you think of a fish, you imagine, you know, maybe these things that I have on screen here, this, you know, salmon looking thing or this reef fish looking thing. And... Yes, those are fish, but there are uh, some diverse definitions of fish that uh, you should be aware of so that you know what you're working with. So the first thing is, how do we define a fish? Let's talk about what I consider the four things that make a fish a fish, okay? So the first thing is that they are cold-blooded, all right? Fish are cold-blooded. Cold-blooded, if you don't know, means that your temperature relies on the temperature of your environment. You are not capable of creating and pumping heat throughout your body. So if it's hot in the water, you are hot. If it's cold in the water, you are cold, okay? This can be an adaptation restriction for a lot of animals. Uh, number two, fish are vertebrates. They have vertebral columns which support their body. Basically think like a spine in us, though it's a little bit more complicated and diverse than that. That is the general idea. Number three, fish live in and thrive via water, aka aquatic environments, whether it's freshwater, saltwater, or somewhere in between, which we call brackish water. Uh, fish are aquatic by definition. And four, fins and gills. Fish will have gills that diffuse dissolved oxygen from the water into their blood, and they will have fins for locomotion, okay? And these are the general four rules that you can apply to determine whether something is a fish or not. Of course, all relationships are determined evolutionarily for the main part. So this is just a convenient morphological traits that we can use to associate these things. It doesn't necessarily always apply, and you'll see that when we look at exceptions. For cold-blooded, there's the opa, which is a fully warm-blooded fish. Of course, not to the extent that, you know, mammals are warm-blooded. Uh, and then there's lots of other fast-moving fish, such as tuna, which are actually able to circulate heat in their bodies. So they're not what you would call cold-blooded. They're not to the full level of warm-blooded, but they don't fit that definition. As far as vertebrates, there's ancestral orders of fish that have things called notochords, which are basically just ancestral versions of vertebra. Um, they're still technically vertebrates, but the definition you can see is a little bit broad. And then there are some fish such as hagfish, uh, which the actual presence of vertebra is debatable. Um, so there are potentially some fish families or orders that don't have any, uh, any vertebra. Number three for aquatic, we have mudskippers. Mudskippers spend 90% of their time on land, though I would say this is the most, uh, the least strict exception because they are still aquatic based. They still need the water, thrive via the water. The water is their environment. They just spend most of their time out of the water, but they're still wet in that environment. Um, but there are fish that are primarily not aquatic. Uh, and as far as fins and gills go, uh, lungfish actually use lungs to breathe primarily. They're what's called facultative breathers. Um, they can breathe with their lungs from the air, from the atmospheric oxygen, unlike just from the, the dissolved oxygen in the water uh, when they need to. And then hagfish have no defined fins. So there are obviously notable exceptions uh, no matter what you're looking at. And it's important to keep that in mind because not everything is going to be so easy as to fit your exact description what you're thinking of when you think of a fish. You know, it's just... Life can't be that easy, unfortunately. When we're talking about fish, we're talking about extremely, extremely old, hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Um, things are not going to be as simple as, you know, differences between human beings or other more recently evolved uh, groups of animals. 
All right, so now let's talk about what isn't a fish because you might be thinking, okay, so defining what exactly is a fish can be a little bit complicated, but it should be pretty easy to tell what isn't a fish, right? So let's look at humans just as a easy example. If we go down the list, humans are vertebrates. Yeah, that's true, but they're not aquatic. We're not cold blooded and we don't have fins or gills. At least I don't last time I checked which you would think then and that means we've checked off only one and three of the four things that we listed as requirements for being a fish are x'd out which means that this is not a fish right by those definitions that we we've defined uh, but actually if we look evolutionarily all of the tetrapodes okay evolved from ancient fish okay this isn't the best diagram but it's not bad all of the tetrapodes, which you'll see up here, which are a lot of the animals that you see nowadays, like the reptiles, amphibians, the mammals, the birds, all came from some of the first fish to walk on land. You might recognize the tiktalik here, the first fish to walk on land, okay? And those tetrapodes are the common ancestor between, like I said, birds, lizards, mammals, which includes human beings. So evolutionarily, humans come from fish. Uh, in fact, lizards, birds, amphibians, all mammals come from fish. And so by a taxonomical definition, they are technically fish. And so you can go tell your friends that you are a fish. And you're right. Taxonomically, you are a fish. But that's not a really great way to, to define something. Um, because if we go by that, that logic, then e almost everything that we can observe in our world outside of, you know, fauna, or outside of uh, flora is going to be a fish. So taxonomically, yes, all of the tetrapodes are fish. Amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, even us human beings are fish. But the way that we use the word fish now and the way that we're going to be using it in this class is just a convenient way of saying in between the lancelets and the tetrapodes, okay? The things that would evolve into fish, which we will talk about next lecture when we talk about taxonomy, uh, all the way up to the tetrapodes, the very end of uh, what you would define as a fish, and you start defining them as other things like reptiles, amphibians. So while yes, technically, all of the tetrapodes are fish, it really doesn't make sense to define them that way. So the group that we call fish actually has a, a beginning and an ending point, which is not typical when you talk about taxonomy of animals. Uh, like if you talk about the taxonomy of reptiles, you're talking about the most ancestral reptile and all of the reptiles that came from that. When you talk about birds, you're talking about the most ancestral bird and all the birds that came from that. When you talk about fish, you are, you are talking about the most ancestral fish, yes, but you're not talking about all of the descendants that came from that because some of those descendants are so morphologically distinct uh, nowadays, you know, in the modern environment that it's not even worth referring to them as fish anymore. Uh, it's still worth knowing the evolutionary relationship, which is why I mention it, but uh, it shouldn't be something that you uh, keep in mind so much. All right. So for the end of this lecture, this is just going to be an easy first introduction le lecture to fish. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the diversity of fishes in general, because uh, I think it's important to just see what's out there because there's some pretty cool stuff and I'm not going to mention a ton of stuff. Next episode, we're actually going to go through, I said next episode, next lecture, we're actually going to go through the uh, whole taxonomy of all living fish and some extinct fish uh, for that matter as well. So you'll actually know the whole breakdown of how fish evolved, where they came from, how they got to where they are now and everything in between. Um, but for now, we're just going to look at some of the cool diversity that you know sprouted along the way. Uh, so the first thing we'll go is a coelacanth. It's actually my favorite fish. Uh, they have lobe fins, which resemble tetrapod fin or tetrapod limbs more than typical fish fins. So those those first animals to walk on land, the coelacanth here, which is still alive, by the way, there are still living coelacanths. Its fins resemble those animals that would eventually walk on land more than it does, you know, regular bony fish fins. They were thought to be extinct. Everyone's heard this story that around 100 years ago, some living specimens were found from the Indian Ocean. Uh, they weren't actually extinct, and the human race as a whole didn't think they were extinct, actually. There were uh, lots of local fishermen who knew what they were, but they just wouldn't bring them in. They'd throw them over because they're really bad eating. They're really ancestral. They've got the notochord. They've got not really meaty flesh, these lobe fins. They're not really useful to humans in any way, so fishermen would catch them, throw them overboard, and thus they were never really... Uh, 
tracked until eventually one was brought back to a market for whatever reason. Scientists happened to observe it, noticed the connection between some fossils that they had seen and this animal, and found out that there are actually two living species of coelacanths still alive, though most of them are now extinct. Uh, they have notochords, which we again we will talk about. I'm going to say the word notochord a lot because it is somewhat important. Um, basically, what you need to know for now is it's like a developmental version of the spine. Uh, it's basically what most animals have as they grow into getting a spine. Uh, you know, the vertebral column that we we associate with a vertebra, um, but they have it their entire lives. Uh, and a lot of these ancestral fish will have these notochords their entire lives because it's a precursor to actual vertebra. So when we get to anatomy, we'll talk about notochords a little bit more. But for now, just understand that it is like a more uh, primal version of a spinal cord. Uh, the Dunkleosteus, you know, I couldn't leave out all of the extinct fish in this. There are a lot of very cool extinct fish, and I thought it was uh, important to talk about some of the cool ones so that people got to know them because I really like extinct fish and talking about extinct fish, but they're not brought up much in ichthyology. I guess because the main uses of ichthyology is talking about things as they are in the modern day, how we can manage fisheries, stuff like that. So when we talk about these extinct fish, it almost seems like we're kind of wasting our time because we can't really manage anything. But you can always learn from the past. I think, I think it's important to have that knowledge under your belt. So the Dunkleosteus didn't actually have teeth, despite what you're, uh, you're seeing here. Uh, its jaw extended into plates. So it basically had a, an elongated jaw with plate-like teeth that it could use to chomp down. They uh, actually got decent sized. The largest one, which is Dunkleosteus torelli, reached nearly 30 feet long, which uh, is hard to conceptualize, but is really big, close to the, some of the biggest sharks. Uh, and it had a bite force up to 750 kilograms at the tips of these blade-like teeth. So not only are they not teeth, you know, they don't have that like breakaway ability that you, you think about when you think about teeth, there are actually, you know, these sharp plates built into the jaw, and they have that insane bite force. So the Dunkleosteus was definitely a, a creature to be reckoned with, and an interesting one that a lot of people associate with. And a lot of people who like paleontology will talk about this as, like, the extinct fish that you pay attention to. This, and I'd say maybe lead sick these. Another one is the lungfish. So lungfish have these weird, you'll see them here, long filamentous fins. Fins is a, we'll call them fins. <laughs> it's a little complicated. Uh, super interesting development they've got there. They can actually breathe uh, atmospheric oxygen, like I had mentioned earlier. So again, we'll talk about when we get to respiration and internal anatomy. Um, but basically, gills allow fish to take oxygen out of water and put it into their blood, right? And in humans, the way that we breathe is we take oxygen out of the air and put it into our blood. Lungs do that, right? So you have specialized structures depending on what you're doing. Gills if you're trying to take oxygen out of water, and lungs if you're trying to take oxygen out of atmospheric air. Uh, well, these guys actually have both, which is pretty awesome. So they have these gills and these gill slits, but they also have these lungs. So they're actually able to choose in oxygen-rich environments to stay under the water and breathe uh, dissolved oxygen from the water, or in oxygen poor environments, uh, they are able to go up to the surface, gulp air, and actually get oxygen out of that. Uh, and they do this amazing thing where they'll dig themselves into riverbeds and go into a hibernation type state. And they can live in that state for over around a year uh, in a completely dry riverbed. So basically they'll inhabit a river, they'll dig themselves into the riverbed, you know, below the dirt in the river. Okay, the river will dry up as rivers do. Sometimes rivers are not there all year long, especially, you know, around the equator and below. Rivers are not there all year long. They dry up and come back. And sometimes it's not even a one year thing, sometimes or a seasonal thing, you know. Sometimes they're gone for a full year and they come back the next year. It can depend on a lot of a lot of factors. The lungfish basically can dig itself into the mud. This is a fish. This is an actual fish and go into a hibernation completely dry no you know the riverbed has nothing in it to the you know average person it's a completely dry riverbed for a year straight and then the water will flow back in and they'll come out and they'll reanimate and they'll be perfectly fine and continue living their lives uh it's a pretty awesome adaptation next we've got lanternfish uh this is probably one of those fish unless you've seen my video on them you've never actually heard about uh because they don't get more than a foot in length you know a foot is pretty much like their maximum that we could imagine one reaching, uh, but yet they have the largest biomass of any vertebrate. 
So if you don't know, biomass is basically the amount of weight of organism that exists out there. Uh, so when you think about, you know, the weight of organisms, if you think about something like the whale shark, you know, the largest fish, you got to imagine one whale shark weighs enough for like 10,000 of these little under a foot things, probably more than that, honestly. Uh, and yet, this is still, this species alone has more biomass than any other vertebrate. It's, it's absolutely insane. Uh, they're actually so abundant that when we used to use sonars, and the Navy used to use sonars to try and map out the ocean floor or look for submarines, uh, things like that, the sonars would actually reflect off of them because there was such a thick layer of these lantern fish in the ocean. And on the sonar, that looks like a sea floor. So the way that sonars work is they send out a signal. The signal bounces back off, to, off of the solid objects, which is usually the bottom of the ocean. And then that signal, how long it takes to get back, will tell the ship, you know, the sonar, how far the signal had to travel. And then basically you can map out as it goes along, you know, the depth and the height and how long it took to go down. Um, but what was happening was they were actually mapping out a false seafloor. So the actual seafloor was way down here, but the sonar is bouncing off of like here and coming back up because of this thick population of lanternfish. Uh, and another interesting thing is that they, on their own, absorb more carbon dioxide than the entire Amazon rainforest. So these guys are more important than you realize, even if you've never heard of them. Uh, they're extremely important to our ecosystems and absolutely need to be uh, protected. Right now, luckily, there's not many. I believe there's one, maybe two commercial fisheries, uh, meaning wild capture fisheries that deal with these guys. But they're not super useful to us, uh, at least not yet. We're not desperate enough to start going after lanternfish. So for now, they're safe. But uh, who knows how the future will develop as populations dwindle and we become more desperate. Another interesting one is the hagfish. This is the guy that I talked about earlier. He was a part of a bunch of the, uh, the exceptions. They have a skull. They have the bare minimum. Uh, but they debatably don't have a vertebral column. Um, it's pretty interesting how this works. When we get into taxonomy, we'll talk about why they don't have a vertebral column, even though they're fish. You know, they're in the vertebrate clade. Uh, so it doesn't... It's a little bit confusing to be like, okay, well, they're vertebrates, but they don't have a vertebra. How does that work? Uh, and that's, you know, something called de derived characters. It's these, these traits that exist in uh, taxa that don't exist in their ancestors. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to taxonomy, which is next lecture. Uh, they don't really have true fins, and they likely evolved backwards, which is I'm talking about that derived characteristic. So their ancestors would have had vertebra, uh, and they evolved to actually lose those vertebra. So uh, unlike... What you would expect of these would be, you know, ancestral to the vertebrates, that these would have evolved into vertebrates. These have actually evolved from vertebrates, most likely. Of course, that's not necessarily proven yet. So there's always the potential that it's proven that these are ancestral to vertebrates and, you know, I'm full of crap. Uh, and they actually create a slime, this thin, extremely durable and sticky slime when they're stressed. Uh, so, you know, if you try to grab one in a tank or something like that, there's plenty of videos of it on the Internet. Uh, it can be and is currently attempting to be used to create bulletproof vests, which is uh, pretty amazing. It's The main issue is getting that abundance of slime is extremely difficult. Uh, it's really hard to mass produce it on hagfish to make them produce more to the point where we can create products with it and have some kind of you know economic benefit from it. But the slime is really interesting. It's a really interesting natural product that at the very least we'd like to emulate, if not farm ourselves. And then finally, we've got the whale shark. Can't not talk about some of the big boys. This is the largest living fish, yet it is a filter feeder. It is not a predator. Uh, and that's actually a trend throughout the history of fish, that some of the largest fish in existence, these large bony fish, are all filter feeders. The uh, bonerichthys, the lead sickthys, the whale shark. Uh, there are obviously, you know, megalodon, dunkleosteus. There are large predators that existed at one point or another. But some of these largest fish are able to sustain themselves as filter feeders, which I think is really interesting and shows this niche that has existed for you know, hundreds of millions of years. Uh, they actually, the spot patterns you'll notice on the back of the whale shark is so unique to the individual, it's basically a fingerprint. 
Uh, and the actual technology that we can use to identify individual whale sharks, so say you come across a whale shark and you name it and you want to identify it again, there's a software created by NASA which was used to map and identify stars in the sky is actually being used to identify individual whale sharks. Uh, it's a fact I learned from my friend Shark Bites and it's a uh, pretty awesome fact to have NASA technology adapted to identify these guys. They're curious, they're intelligent, and they're crazy docile. Uh, doesn't mean you should be approaching one because in general you just shouldn't be messing with nature when you don't need to. You shouldn't be interfering. But uh, were you to, they are, they are friendly and they are kind and they are actually extremely intelligent as a lot of things get more intelligent with size. Uh, so that's going to be the end of lecture one. Just want to give you an introduction to fish and uh, you know show you some of the diversity, get you interested in. Uh, next lecture, we're going to talk about taxonomy, so we're going to get into actually learning things. We're going to learn all the super orders, uh, essentially, all of the existing fish and how they got where they are and, you know, how evolution did its thing and how everything's defined. Um, so I hope you're looking forward to that. If you enjoyed. Uh, let me know if you have questions in the comments. I'm going to try to be more active with looking at the comments on this type of video because I really do believe that this is important and we should be educating people. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed.